We will continue now in our worship by turning to the book of Psalms, Psalm number 51. Listen again to the word of God this morning. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hiss hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and bright spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on the altar. Friends, this is the, ends the reading of God's holy eternal word. We God alone give the thanks and the praise forever. Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> Which came first, the chicken or the egg? It's a question that philosophers and scholars and high school students have tried to crack for ages to no avail. The problem is, is that there's convincing arguments on both sides, and so the debate never gets resolved. I suppose, though, that it doesn't really matter which came first, the chicken or the egg, because at the end of the day, we have chicken and we have eggs. So it really doesn't matter which came first. Although I'll admit it's fun to talk about. This morning, as we encounter our two scripture lessons this morning, we may be in confronting another chicken and egg controversy. This one as it relates to King David's great prayer of confession contained in Psalm 51. His words reach out to us this morning. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, cleanse me from my iniquity. Wash me thoroughly from my transgressions and cleanse me from my sin. David cries to God with a sense of urgency, a sense of a deep felt need. Now the question is, where does that need come from? Tradition places these words towards the latter half of David's life and reign as king over Israel. It is thought that he penned them in the aftermath of the confrontation he had with the prophet Nathan over, this, over his sins involving Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. The, the drama of that confrontation is remarkable. The prophet comes to the king telling him a story. A story about a very wealthy man who received an unexpected visitor. Not wanting to take one of his own many head of livestock in order to prepare a meal for his visitor, he takes the one ewe lamb of a poor servant, kills it, and prepares it for his friend to eat. As the king hears this story, he rails with anger at the injustice 
that has been described to him. He demands the right of judgment. And then the prophet looks at the king and says, you, king, are the man. You are the man. 2 Samuel chapter 12 tells that story. And what it tells us is that in that moment, all David could say is, I have sinned against the Lord. It is believed that Psalm 51 is a fuller expression of the guilt that David felt in that moment as the prophet confronted him over his sins of taking Bathsheba to be his own and then having her husband Uriah killed in battle in order to cover up the mess that he made. But it's not just a prayer of confession, for it also is a prayer of hope, for David reaches beyond the confession recognizing that God is a God who can forgive, that God is a God who does forgive. And so he does not just pray, have mercy on me, but he reaches for hope. Create me a clean heart, O Lord, and put within me a new and right spirit. Cast me not away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and put a new faithful spirit within me. David prays to the Lord, and as we encounter that prayer in this particular context, we hear both a challenge and an invitation this morning. The, the challenge is to, like David, recognize the expanse of human need and brokenness and the sin that causes it. You know, Scripture is never shy about naming the reality of human need that embraces each one of us. Isaiah named it in the Old Testament. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And Paul in the New Testament echoes him. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The thing is, is that Scripture doesn't stop there with the naming of our sin and our brokenness. For there is also a solution. And so Isaiah continued. And he laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And by our wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. Pointing the Jews of his day and the church of every day to the cross upon which Jesus Christ hung. And later Paul would pick up and echo that same sentence. We are justified by grace which is a free gift through the redemption of Jesus Christ on the cross. Seen in this context, human brokenness is not the final word. There is hope of forgiveness. And so along with the challenge to recognize sin comes the hope that we too can be cleansed, that we too can be restored. And so to pray along with David, to give ourselves over to the cleansing grace of our Savior God, creating us clean hearts, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within us. Viewed in this context, the psalm has a powerful word to speak to us, both in conviction and in hope. But what if we're wrong about that context? What if the egg came before the chicken? And what if these words came to David in prayer, not in the moments after he caught a look at Beersheba and turned his head for a moment from serving the Lord. But what if it was in the moments after Samuel had poured the oil anointing over his head, as the very drops of it dripped from his hair onto his shoulders? Would we be surprised at David's concern in that moment? I mean, he was a rather unlikely choice to be king, after all. So unlikely, in fact, that he wasn't even invited to the party. Prophet Samuel had come to Bethlehem to anoint a new king for Israel because the first and current king, Saul, had failed to live up to God's expectation for their king. Saul, Samuel was naturally worried, for Saul would not take lightly his replacement being declared in the midst of his reign. So God gave them a cover story. He was to go and offer a sacrifice and to invite the family of the Bethlehem, Bethlehemite named Jesse to join him for the sacrifice. So when Samuel comes to Bethlehem, he invites not just Jesse and his family, but the elders of the town to come with them. And it's in the midst of the festivities that Samuel begins to take stock of Jesse's son, 
believing that he's been called to anoint one of them as king. He begins with the oldest, who is also the tallest and the strongest. Surely this will be God's choice. But God says, no, he's not the one. So Samuel moves on to the second oldest, recognizing that he has a tremendous upside. No. Five more times, five more sons pass by Samuel. Five times the response comes, no, this is not the one. Samuel turns to Jesse and says, is there another? Just David, but he's only good for keeping the sheep. Get it, Samuel said. And when David was brought before him, God said, yep, this is the one. So Samuel took out the oil and anointed David as king over Israel. Now we could question who was the most surprised by this. Was it Samuel who seemed to have a preconceived notion of what a king looks like and who a king will be? Was it the brothers who had been taught from birth to see themselves and their value in terms of their birth order relative one to another? Was it Jesse who so undervalued his youngest son that he even hadn't even thought to invite him to come to the sacrifice? Or was it David himself? What if it was David himself? And what if this prayer speaks to his fear and his hope in the midst of the weight of the call that has now been placed upon his shoulders? Here we find David standing before God, completely aware that he has no business standing before God. It's a good thing this isn't a trial, because if it were, David's going to fully incriminate himself. I know my transgressions, and my sins are ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty and a sinner when my mother conceived me. Looking at the psalm this way, as David considers the call that has been put before him, like Abraham, Sarah, and Moses before him, and Isaiah after him, he can find nothing within himself to justify the call. For as he said, he is a sinner, born guilty, Convicted from his birth. As he is confronted by the holiness of God. There's no worth, no merit, no value that he can find to give him any hope of possibly serving a God that's so a God that's so big. Now the interesting thing about the prayer is that doesn't stop David in his tracks. For unlike Abraham and Sarah before him and Isaiah who will come after him, David recognizes something beyond himself. And so after the confession comes the plea, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. For David, a recognition of his insufficiency is not the end of the conversation. For that recognition simply makes way for another recognition. Recognition of God's sufficiency. That God is the one who can take what is weak and turn it into something that is strong. Who can take what is old and tarnished and make it shine again. Who can take what is broken and make it whole again. David knew the stories of his faith. He knew what God had done with Abraham and Sarah, with Isaac, with Jacob and Esau, with Joseph and his brothers. He knew what God had done with Moses and the Israelites, bringing them out of slavery and carrying them through the wilderness journeys and into the promised land. He knew what God could do. And so when confronted with a call that was much bigger than he was, a call that made him shrink in the reality of his sin and need, he was still able to pray, creating me a clean heart, O oh God and renew a right spirit within me. There's something about our God. When, when he called Abraham and Sarah, he knew that they were going to struggle with fear. When he called Moses and the Israelites, he knew that they were going to struggle with doubt. When he called David, he knew that, they were going to, that he was going to struggle with sin. And the thing is, God called them anyway. God 
used them anyway. God worked in them to shine his love to the world that surrounded them. What if, in the moment that Samuel was pouring the oil down over David's head, saying, you are God's choice to be king, what if he was aware that he himself was going to struggle? And what if he had named that awareness in the song? But then went on to name another awareness. That God is a God who works in the midst of our fears and our doubts and our weakness. That God had done it before, so God would do it again in him. And then what if God did exactly that? Using David in all of his goodness and all of his struggle to shine the light of his love in the world. Give us hope for our call. For God's asking us to join Him in what He wants for creation, to work every day to shine love in places where love doesn't work, where it is invisible, to bring light where darkness reigns, to bring hope in the face of hopelessness. It is a big task, a task that can make us shrink, that can make us feel small. It's then that we ought to remember that before there was a call, a call for David, a call for Abraham and Sarah, a call for Peter and the others, before there was a call, there was grace and there was love. And so we do have hope. And so we pray. Create in us clean hearts, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we give you thanks for your steadfast mercy, for you work in us and you work through us, shaping and molding and forming us into the image of your Son, our Savior, and then sending us out to reflect your glory. Lord, do your work in us so that you may do your work through us. We make this prayer in Jesus.